This is the Fallout 4 Experience. We start off making our unnecessarily jacked but apparently short character after hogging the bathroom mirror from our wife for the last 20 minutes, then proceeding to go nowhere. Meet our robot butler Codsworth who is a Mr. Handy, the pride of General Atomics, and does everything for us, including making us coffee, taking care of our only son so that we don't have to spend time with him, and many unspoken and taboo chores. There's a well-dressed man at the door who seems like he's in a rush to speak to us. It's a matter of utmost urgency, I assure you. He also seems nervous, but I've never been one for door-to-door -door salesmen. Go away. He's nothing if not persistent though. Filling out his dodgy form, we spec our character to be charismatic and lucky, whilst a fucking idiot at the same time. At least now we have access to the local vault. It's in the unforeseen event of <coughs> total atomic annihilation. That sounds pretty sus. Now get out. Oh, he walked off and left his car outside. Hmm. <laughs> Old man Sean's crying. But who has time for that? Codsworth needs us. There's a somber looking man on the TV who tells us the world is ending and nuclear bombs are being flung all over the place by a bunch of angry children. Shit, it was convenient that the salesman came by to secure our place in the vault. Hopefully he managed to get that form filled out and sent to the vault in that three minutes since he left. It's almost as if... Vault Tet knew exactly when the bombs were going to drop. It's getting wild out here as we head for Vault 111, passing many people who are too focused on their luggage and possessions and will surely die in the nuclear fires of hell if they don't hurry up. But we should probably stop to take in the scenery because damn, that's the best this river is probably ever gonna look. Okay, it looks like Mr. Well Dressed got our file to the vault despite the fact that they won't let him into the vault himself. Well, thanks for helping us out, we call out behind us. We'll remember you for as long as we can hear your voice. Okay, beautiful, we made it onto the platform. And would you look at the scenery. Oh my god! Hold on! Well, that was a close one. Oh baby, a new jumpsuit. This is gonna look swish. Just step in here and put your vault suit on. Oh, and you want me to get changed in front of everyone? Well, I guess I have no choice. Guess we've got to climb into these pods to get ready for our new life in Vault 111. And we've been frozen. I'm sure it's all part of the procedure. And there we go. We're being unfrozen after surely only seconds, maybe minutes at a stretch. My wife's being defrosted for... Oh, oh, oh no, my wife and baby who I've spent a total of five minutes with. How am I ever going to live without them? And we're being frozen again. Okay, back awake. Ready to go and rescue my son who was just stolen. Everyone in the vault appears dead. Well, we're either very lucky or very unlucky depending on how you look at it. Definitely unlucky, definitely unlucky. We must have missed a weapon completely because we were just bare fisting these giant mutated roaches. This vault really fell to shit in the five minutes we were asleep in that pod. Oh wow, a gun. That's a weird thing to leave lying around, but it's better than getting my hands covered in roach guts. And we're coming back for that later. He never came back for it. A portable wrist computer attached to a skeleton's arm? Don't mind if I do. I'm not going to question why there's a skeleton here. Finally, we make our way out of the abandoned vault, make the decision to stay funny but dumb, and head back to the surface to find old man Sean. As we rise in the elevator, we realise that you haven't subscribed to the Regulus Plays channel yet. We've been uploading Fallout 4 Let's Plays for a while. First link in description, self-plug over. Wow. Would you look at that view? The scenery is just... Wow. Sanctuary Hills, looking just as idyllic as it once did. And Codsworth is still here. <gasps> You're suffering from hunger-induced paranoia. Not eating properly for 200 years will do that, I'm afraid. He tells us we've been down in the vault for over 200 years. And now that he mentions it, I could eat. He suggests we search for Old Man Sean around the destroyed and ravaged town of Sanctuary. 
after checking two houses and popping some enormous bugs. Codsworth gives up, but he suggests we try to talk to the people in Concord who always shoot at him. What could possibly go wrong? Ah, yes, this bodes well for the journey ahead. Holy shit, what was... Oh, it's a dog. Okay, I found my new best friend of all time. We're under attack by giant mole rats, who dig underground and pop up behind you. Thank god we found that pistol. What is it with all of these giant bugs? Entering Concord, we hear gunshots. I'm getting the feeling that Codsworth was actually just trying to get us out of the way, so that he could take over and rule Sanctuary. Oh, these must be the people that Codsworth wanted me to talk. Nope, nope, nope. I guess we're killing people now. And dog meat's definitely killed a few people in his time. Guess we should go in and talk to the guys who were killing all these people. The enemy of my enemy, I guess. This looks a little different to my standard pistol. Pop those two guys about a second thought and take a run through the Civil War Museum. I meant to shoot that guy, but that works too. My brain broke on this terminal and had to reload. But I got a fusion core, so who really won? This guy hit my dog, so I shoved his entire body through a door and proceeded to open and close the door until he was well and truly not having a good time. The guy who yelled at us from the balcony needs our help to escape. Preston Garvey wants us to grab some power armor and literally rip a mounted minigun from a crashed vertebird to kill hundreds of people just trying to survive in order to save the five people in the museum. Yeah, sounds like fun. Head outside, push in that power core we found, and pull on your sexy new suit of T-45 power armor, complete with rust. Tear off the minigun and jump straight off the roof into the field of battle. Power armor negates all four damage too. Mow down all the unsuspecting raiders ahead of you, until you hear the most terrifying noise you've ever heard. Take over, blast control, world government, shut down infrastructure, ship everything to China. <laughs> the ear splitting and horrifying voice of Alex Jones spouting on about something or another. Apparently, I had an old mod installed that made Death Claws sound like Alex Jones. I can't even imagine why I installed this in the first place. Making this initial Death Claw fight. 10 times funnier and scarier at the same time. I then uninstalled the mod. Or so I thought. Once the menacing creature is slain, the crew is all gathered inside the museum entrance. There, they'll tell you they're going to head to a place called Sanctuary. Sound familiar? Agree to meet them there and off they go, while you lumber along in your now damaged and quickly depleting power armor. Dumping the power armor at the Red Rocket truck stop, we meet up with the gang at Sanctuary, who immediately ask for our help, with, again, nothing in return. So you set out helping them to make this house into a home, with some shitty beds, a water pump, irradiated food, and some high-tech gun turrets to mow down enemies. We have a good chat to the drug-addled old bat named Mama Murphy, who after getting high on jet, tells us about Diamond City, the great green jewel of the Commonwealth which is where we should head to find out more about our missing son. The Garvmeister will also send us to save a settlement on behalf of the Minutemen. On the way to the new settlement, a large quarry filled with water. The area became yellowy green and made it hard to see because of a rad storm taking place. Near a water pump, there was a dodgy looking man who wasn't convinced by my plea for more money. Had to push, didn't you? 50 caps, take it or leave it. We took care of him though, and then completed his quest anyway, just to spite him. Emptying the water from the dam, riled up the giant crab men called Myalurks. At the new settlement, you'll quickly learn the Minutemen aren't the good guys, as the two people here will send you to the large Corvega assembly plant, where you'll be expected to kill hundreds if not thousands of raiders, just living their life with families and friends in order to help two goddamn people living by themselves out in the middle of the commonwealth. A little further along, there was also some dude holding up an old lady and her son, so we took all his money and then killed him and his partner anyway. After this test of your conviction, Preston will thank you and immediately promote you to the literal general of the Minutemen. Don't worry, I'll be right beside you all the way, general. This promotion comes with the fact that you're still expected to do everything for the Minutemen, and no one will even lift a finger to help you. But now you can use Preston as a companion, 
so that he can constantly tell you when a settlement needs your help. Somewhere along our travels to Corvega, we picked up a mysterious radio signal. Upon listening, we learned that a group known as the Brotherhood of Steel are pinned down in the Cambridge Police Station. We fight our way through some zombie-like creatures called ghouls, before coming across the police station which is being invaded by armies of ghouls, which we'll help the Brotherhood take down. A giant man named Paladin Dance in enormous power armor will speak to us about helping them further. We accompany Dance on a short and leisurely stroll through the Commonwealth to a complex called Arc Jet Systems, where we battle through a collection of enemies called Synths, which look like shitty androids or robots. Of course, we had to blast Dancy Boy with a jet engine to eliminate the remaining Synths, of course. Yeah, I definitely knew his power armor could survive that. Mm hmm, mm hmm. Finally, we retrieve his deep range transmitter and leave the building where he gives us a sexy little laser rifle of his own design. Well, I guess he doesn't hold a grudge for the almost being burnt alive thing. He asks us to join the Brotherhood of Steel, but we get a little nervous and run off giggling before we can give him an answer. We decide to start making our way towards Diamond City, but come across another vault, Vault 81, who after a failed persuasion attempt, despite having high charisma, ask us to return with three fusion cores in exchange for letting us in. Maybe we'll come back. We made it into the main city of the common, an emptied hardware town of the raiders who had murdered and stored a bunch of dead naked people underground. Interesting choice. Ah, uh, finally, Diamond City is closed. You. You want into Diamond City, right? But this 1950s reporter named Piper is here to help us get into Diamond City, was conveniently allowing herself to slip in at the same time. But don't worry, she actually lives here. The mayor just doesn't like her newspaper. Diamond City is located in a large pre-war baseball stadium, actually a really cool place for a settlement. Pipe has her sister doing child labor and selling newspapers right by the entrance. Hey kiddo, how are the paper sales? Take a walk through the dodgy back alleys and come across the Valentine's Detective Agency. But Nick, the detective who's supposed to help me find my missing son is missing himself. He can't be all that good. Piper asked us to do an interview for her paper. I want an interview. Your life story in print. Where we talked a bit of shit. Here's your headline. Local man says no. Had some laughs, but overall a good time. It was just me and a thousand guinea pigs. They turned carnivorous. Okay. Upon exiting her house, a man was being accused of being a synth. The man doing the accusing was then gunned down and everyone went about their business as usual. Abbott on the wall asked me to grab some green paint, despite shit talking him constantly. Whatever. So we headed back to Hardware Town, but we'd already cleared it out so we quickly mixed some green paint, brought it back, then badly painted a very different shade of green on the wall. Okay, enough fucking around. We should probably go find Nick Valentine. So we head deeper into the common beyond Diamond City. No more distractions. Oh shit, a comic book shop. Maybe they've got Grognak the Barbarian issue number 9 in the Lair of the Virgin Eater. But as we enter, we're attacked by unlimited ghouls who just keep appearing out of nowhere forever until the end of time. We made it to the studio on the top floor, then proceeded to get domed by an incredibly irradiated ghoul called a Glowing One who revived all his ghoul friends before unleashing the largest bitch slap the world has ever seen. We came back with vengeance and pettiness in our heart, and nuked this freak with grenades. No issue number 9 here though, just a grognak costume, which we promptly slip into and look like an epic cosplayer, along with a silver shroud costume for later tonight. Just down the street, a lovely and peaceful pond, with an enormous swan man who erased our existence with the throw of a single rock. I think we should avoid the pond this time. Our tour guide Protectron informs us about the Freedom Trail, which we'll follow later on. A brief dip into the underground post-apocalyptic metro system sounds pretty tempting right now, but it's filled with 1950s gangsters, which is debatably more terrifying than horrifying post-apocalyptic creatures. Doming every trigger man we come across all the way into and through another vault. Old Nicky boy is locked at the end in his own private room. Obviously we open the door for him and oh god what the fuck is that? Oh, oh that's Nick. Well it would have been nice for someone to tell me that he was a discarded synth prototype 
but I guess those in Diamond City just don't see race. After recovering from the intense shock of this discovery, we head out of the vault, doming even more gangsters with our new friend Nick at our side. But the ironically named Skinny Malone awaits by the outer door of the vault with his new fling, Dala. But apparently this was the only part of the entire game that didn't feel like recording. Now that we've saved you, Nicky boy, where the goddamn hell is old man Sean? Together we come to the realization that the ones who stole Sean from the vault were cornflakes. You didn't hear the name Kellogg at all, did you? Or something like that, I wasn't really paying attention. Conveniently, Kellogg's Cocoa Pops had a house in Diamond City, so Nick and I are gonna be all sneaky-like and break it. Oh, the door's locked. Never mind, plan foiled, let's go home. Instead, we head for the mayor's office to ask him for the key and- Oh, nope, he won't help us. What? Shit, I'm lost now. Aha! The mayor's receptionist gives us the key after working our magic and we're in. To Sultana Brand's house, obviously, in case you weren't keeping up and paying attention. Inside, nothing. Except for a big secret red glowing button under the desk which reveals a secret room with supplies and a comfy chair for smoking and drinking. And we have a lead. San Francisco Sunlights. The cigarette. Dog Meat also smokes San Francisco Sunlights, so he has a good nose for them. What? The great clockwork dick is stumped? It's synth detective, jackass. But before any of that, somewhere along the way, we found the fusion cores we needed to enter Vault 81. So we head there, and they led us, a complete stranger, into their vault of women, children, and old people. Heading down the elevator, some random kid offers to take us for a tour of the vault for an exorbitant five caps, but we counter offer with zero caps, and promise not to raise this entire vault if he agrees. After a few stops, we cancel the tour because of the intense boredom and head off ourselves. A doctor takes our blood without paying us and then proceeds to not speak to us again. I feel like I've been scammed. Some kid lost her cat, so we had to go out in the wasteland to find it and send it home. Surprisingly enough, it headed straight back into the vault with no detours, yet wasn't trained well enough to stay in the vault in the first place. We then told a classroom full of children about our murdering of raiders and the propaganda rants of Alex Jones, which they loved. I was hurt pretty badly, but Preston and I finally killed it. Wow. Shortly after, we discover that the kid who took us for a tour has been bitten by a mole rat and is dying. Being the good Samaritan heroes we are, we head off into this second vault, which is hidden to find a cure. We learn the second vault was used to monitor Vault 81, which means that there were vault Tech scientists monitoring and listening to everything going on in the vault, until they were overrun with infected mole rats, and were all eaten. Good times, hey? We avoid getting bitten for as long as we can, but eventually they sneak up on us and we're infected. We're gonna die like the kid. In minutes we'll be curled up in a ball on the floor, our life flashing before our eyes. It's actually just a minus 10 HP debuff. We finally find a room with a Mrs. Handy, Mr. Mrs. Nanny, whatever they're called, called Curie locked inside, who has developed a cure for the bite. But she only has one. Dun dun dun! We save her and lead her out of the second vault, rewarding us with a new companion for later. Freedom at long last. Bringing the cure to the doctor who stole our blood, we ask to split it, but everyone gets angry with us. Stop being selfish and just give me the serum and we're peer pressured into giving it to the kid and letting ourselves be slightly weaker for the rest of our lives. But we did just get our own room in the vault, which we'll never ever use. So goodbye Vault 81, forever. So let's get on with the important stuff, finding out where Rice Bubbles buys his cigars, cause dog meat has run out. The hunt led us to some dogs who wanted to replace dog meat, but I wasn't gonna let that happen. We also fought a giant mutated bear, or Yao Guai, which we were woefully unprepared for, but managed to pull through. After Dogmeat got real stuck and confused on a destroyed Assaultron for a while, we finally made it to our destination, Fort Hagen, which we promptly ran away from because there's no way we were ready. Instead we went back to Paladin Dance and joined the Brotherhood, which made old Reesey Boy very upset. Let's just hug this out and get it over with. What do you say? You can play it however you want, tough guy. It's gonna take a lot more than completing one mission to impress me. Probably because he knows we're better than him in every single way. So Reese and Halen sent us on different missions to help the boys in steel. 
We secured some loot that was important in some way or another, and cleared the college square of the army of ghouls infesting the area. All in a day's work for the Brotherhood. See, Reese, I told you I was better. We were taking a leisurely jaunt through the wasteland when we came across the second apocalyptic event in the Commonwealth. An endless supply of mutated mole rats, apparently breeding whilst fighting to continually produce infinite glowing and dangerous mole rats, leaving me overwhelmed and a little hungry. Ah, uh, the reprieve we need after that encounter. A walled community called Covenant. But we have to pass a test to enter? The GOAT TEST! A test I'm pretty sure you can't fail, but sure. We passed apparently, and were allowed entry into the tiny but defended Covenant, where we meet a man called Honest Dan. With a name like that, we have to trust him. He let us know that a caravan was attacked nearby and someone was stolen, while the rest were killed. So we have to go on a detective case with the trusty Nick Valentine by our side and start asking everyone very obvious questions. Do you know anything about a missing caravan? At which point most people close up and don't tell us anything. Until our fifth attempt at talking to Penny, where she drops a little goss and then secretly enter the locked house and read the secret terminal and learn of the secret compound. On the way there, the mayor stops us. But sorry, mayor, we're not in the business of being bribed. Unless you offer a lot more money than you did. But Nick interrupts us and then we have to talk to the mayor all over again. Honest Dan meets us at the entrance to the compound where our conversation with the guards doesn't go so well. I just want answers. That's unfortunate. So we kill every single person in the compound without a hint of regret before being told that the girl who was kidnapped was probably a synth. But I want to look good in front of Nick. So I say I don't care. Then you'll just have to kill me. And gun down the doctor save the girl, and Nick absolutely loves it. Upon our triumphant return to Covenant, all town members try in vain to kill us. But after a few minutes, the previously happy inhabitants of the town are strewn across the floor of their houses while I turn Covenant into my own settlement. On our travels, we've heard rumours of the Freedom Trail before this point, so a little walk in the common reveals its starting point where we follow a red brick line in the road around in circles and then the wrong way, leading us to die a terrible and painful death. We picked up the trail again though, and this time come across the town of Good Neighbor. What a friendly sounding town and a place to find refuge in this terrible wasteland. And we're immediately extorted upon entering. We can't go walking around without insurance. And then watch a colonial ghoul give the most passionate of hugs to the man. But we meet a new friend, Hancock. The most exciting encounter thus far takes place in the Hotel Rexford, where we open a door only to find a familiar face. Well, not so familiar anymore. But I'll never forget those clothes. It's the Vault Tech Rep. How did he survive over 200 years, you may ask, considering he was not allowed entry into the vault? Well, he's a ghoul, obviously. Think with your brain for once. Real funny. Just like that robot of yours. Trimming those damned edges like nothing happened. He's sad, but we send him to Sanctuary with the promise we'll visit him there one day. But back to business. The Freedom Trail. We follow it through numerous threats and locations before coming to an old, rundown church. I think we might have just wasted our time. But we head inside anyway, and eventually come across a sign that can be moved. Thank God we know we're looking for the railroad, because without that knowledge, you're never getting in. We get blinded and a bunch of guns aimed at us, but we talk them down and now we've met the railroad with a particular fella named Deacon who makes us sound like we've got the biggest cock and providing us the opportunity to do a little mission for them. The railroad's entire deal is helping and rescuing synths from the Institute and helping them live normal lives away from being slaves. So we meet up with the disguised Deacon, the only character who has more than one outfit in his wardrobe. He tells us what the signs mean, which we pay no attention to, and find out some info about the old railroad base. But first we gotta go visit our boy, the vault rep in Sanctuary. Proceed to shit-talk him and then return to the railroad mission. A job? For, for me? Just make sure it goes better than your last job. All the things to bring on. We enter the base through the back door, I know lucky me, pop some synths, grab a prototype, and get the fuck out. Railroad let us join, and we get the nickname Bullseye. They obviously haven't seen me shoot without vats. 
we discovered a long protruding building. We got a little too curious and wanted to find Edward Deegan. He hires us for a man named Jack Cabot who we'll go visit a little bit later. But first we have to chat with old man Stockton for the railroad who has us secure an old church for a synth meetup. When we do this without any issue, we guide the synth throughout the dangers of the commonwealth to safety. But who cares about the railroad now? We gotta make our way to Cabot House. Holy shit, we're under attack. Oh no, it's all good and he's friendly, apparently. Jack wants us to take out some raiders near the insane asylum. This bodes well. But first, we stole his fat man. Just in case. On the way there, we pop a super mutant holding a mini nuke, which went badly for all of his friends, and then got assaulted by a Mr. Gutsy and a Soltron duo. Stole the lunch money of some far too powerful raiders in the creamery, and picked up a mysterious serum with some crazy buffs. Upon returning, we lie to Jack and keep the serum, but now we gotta go save his sister. Can this family do nothing for themselves? She's locked in a room by some preacher dude, and she looks a lot older than her younger brother. Jack has a serum that reverses aging. Ah, okay, the serum prevents aging. Makes sense. And the Cabots have been alive for over 400 years because of it. Finally, someone older than me. But no time to catch up on the news of 200 years ago. We have to stop the raiders attacking the insane asylum. So we die a few times and have to restart the whole building again before making it to Magneto, Jack's dad, who's got an artifact stuck to his head, which gives him magic powers, and it's also where the Cabots get the serum from. So we kill him. Jack is secretly happy that his dad's dead, and asks us to come see him in a week for a reward. Dr. Carrington from the railroad sends us to find info in our big multi-level building. We kill a bunch of raiders, and we grab the info. But as we drop down to the bottom floor, we hear the most terrifying noise ever. I didn't delete the mod properly, so Alex Jones emerges and devours us multiple times. We give up on trying to kill him, and instead run around like a scared little chicken, trying to open the door on each pass. Remind me to never come back to this building. The Deathclaw owns it now, he can have it, we're done. Clear out Taffington Boathouse as a synth safe house and build some pathetic little defences. But it's okay because Nick wants a DNM with us about not being human and having his own personality and all that jazz. But off to Fort Hagen to eat some cornflakes. We basically kill every single synth from the Institute and come face to face with Sultana Bran. Where is my son? He's not here. Where is my son? The closet. You mercenary motherfucker. It's just a closet. God damn it, you piece of shit. So, you ready? Monster. Go to hell. Fucker. We dick him down and steal all his shit, including a part of his brain, because he's a bitch and we were feeling petty. Upon exiting Fort Hagen, and after finally getting our sweet, sweet revenge on that serial that wronged us, a gigantic airship flies over the Commonwealth. It belongs to the Brotherhood of Steel, and is called the Pridwin. Do not interfere. Shit, maybe we should have sided with them. I haven't seen any railroad airships or an army of vertebrates or power armor or anything like that. Back at Sanctuary, we switch Nick out for the lovable Curie as a change of companion. We then immediately speak to both Nick and Piper about Kellogg, and then refuse to let either of them come with us, and instead tell Nick to meet us at the memory den. Using that conveniently stolen piece of brain, we implant it into Nick's synthetic head and root around through Kellogg's memories. We should try plugging you into a toaster next. Mmm, fresh toast. We get to relive our trauma from outside the pod. And eventually we find out that old man Sean was taken back to the Institute by a special synth called a Corsa. Using... A teleporter. Oh shit, maybe I want to side with these guys. Is that even an option? All the railroad has is an old church and beds on the floor. The doctor tells us to visit a scientist named Virgil in a supposedly highly irradiated and dangerous area called the Glowing Sea and he escaped the Institute, so he might know how to teleport in. So it's time for us to suit up for the first time since our introduction to the fearsome Alex Jones. A little stroll through Hell's Asshole later, 
We've royally assaulted by gigantic irradiated scorpions who were out for nothing but my blood. So we ran for our lives, deciding that living was far more valuable than glory at the time. Apparently a collection of lunatics lived deep in the glowing sea, worshipping Atom, basically the bombs and nuclear fallout. That sounds like a religion that isn't too conducive to a long life. Stop it! The ominous sounds of Alex Jones briefly ring in our ears, warning us of what was nearby, but finally prompting us to utterly annihilate that godforsaken mod. But finally we made it to Virgil's cave, and here he- Oh holy fuck it's a super mutant, kill it kill it kill it! Oh sorry about that sir, it's Virgil. So bigboy.com, please don't visit that website, tasks you with tracking down an institute Corsa. Basically a super strong synth in order to take a chip from its head, which will help us get into the Institute. He also asks for us to grab an experimental cure if we get into the Institute for him. As we exit the cave, we learn that we finally remove the Alex Jones mod from Fallout 4 lore. And then Curie attacks the Deathclaw and we finally fight our first Deathclaw. We fight for a ton of gunners who kill us a few too many times. We make our way to the Corsa, who proves far easier than expected. Uh, I'm here to pick up an order. Two large pepperoni and a calzone. Name is... Fuck you. We then yank the chip from the skull of his lifeless synthetic corpse, and take it to Tinker Tom from the railroad. After he deciphers the code, we return to Virgil, and he gives us basic blueprints for a signal interceptor to help us finally enter the Institute. Tinker Tom once again helps us fill in the gaps for the schematics of this teleporter. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Who wrote this? Some kid with a crayon? She must have been a real big kid. We briefly return to Jackie Boy a week later for our reward, a weapon using the artifact that was attached to his dad's head until we killed him. Interesting. So we put together all the pieces of the teleporter at the Mercer safe house, and we climb into the obnoxiously loud teleporter. Both Tom and Desdemona feel the need to tell me everything they've ever thought of at the same time, while I can't hear either of them. So stand still, you gotta lock in all those molecules of yours. Do whatever you can to gain their trust. Lie! It's not the institute Find their weaknesses. The information if can. we can just find a way to save them. Holy shit, we finally made it into the institute. It's nice and clean. And there is Sean. Oh my god, it's been so long. I thought I'd never see you at- I don't know you. Go away. He doesn't recognize me. Oh, he's a synth. But this old man named Faber claims to be our son Sean, and that he was taken from the vault 60 years ago instead of recently. I am... your son. He seems to trust us immediately and completely. His mistake. We're told to go and talk to all the big important scientists around the Institute, but we have more important things to do. Breaking into the FEV lab, we fight our way through turrets and a very pissed off Assaultron robot. Assaultron class combat robot to unknown interloper. Reveal yourself immediately. To find Virgil's serum amongst other test tube super mutants. We then load a holotape the railroad gave us onto a computer to meet up with someone called Patriot who has been helping Synths escape the Institute from the inside. So we meet the dude named Liam, and he introduces us to his friend, a Synth named Z114. We decide to help a bunch of Synths escape, but first we need to find an old username and password. So this leads us to a job interview at Cambridge Polymer Labs. But they're short staffed, so we get hired on the spot. Sounds like you need me regardless. I am pleased to offer you the position of Sales Coordinator. Never a good sign for a job interview, boys and girls. But we get a spiffy new suit, so it's all worth it. We get locked in and crawl around in the vents to get out, along with finding the password for Liam. Desdemona suggests saving all the simps and cutting Liam out of the plan, since we'll likely have to murder the entire population of the Institute. Long story short, we give Liam the password, he does his thing, and then we proceed to never speak to him again. We kill a bunch of tunnel guards to save some simps who have been working on the mines, and then Z1 tells us to just work with Father until preparations to liberate the simps are complete. Little did we know just how long this would take. 
A little detour is always fun, so we head to a place called the Combat Zone, which we'd heard about much earlier on, and massacre an entire population of innocent people who were just watching some cage fights, then unlock our new friend, who we never speak to again, Kate. Feels like something's burning a hole in our pocket. Oh, it's the serum for Virgil that he desperately asked us to find for him, and we've had for a decent while. As we hand over the serum, Curie decides she don't want to be a robot no more. So of course we drop everything to help her, and head straight to Dokamari to have her mind transferred into a synth body. The new synth Curie seems to love... punching. Guess if you've lived your whole life without hands, you'd want to use them. Is that a pirate ship? Arg, it be home to some scurvy pirate robots. Damn you, Weatherby Savings and Loan. I spit at you. We help fix and rebuild their boat, the USS Constitution. Some local scavengers had stolen a part from the robots and wouldn't give it back. So we did a little sneaky and stole it. This eagle-eyed lord saw me and they decided they'd rather all die than let me have this one little part back. There's no way this could come back and affect us later, right? So of course we get the ship pretty much fixed and good to go. But alas, we were wrong. The ship is attacked by what I would consider the most goddamn enemies I've ever encountered in a Fallout game with just armies and armies of scavengers attacking the boat from the outside and the inside. Endless waves of them causing unimaginable deaths and quest fails due to friendly fire on the pirate robots. After longer than any other quest, we beat off every single scavenger. I think they might have enjoyed it a bit too much. We've rewarded with a handheld ship cannon that fires literal cannonballs. And we finally get to watch the USS Constitution set sail and be free. The most exciting part of the entire quest. But Fallout 4 has a way of ruining moments. The fog rolls into the Commonwealth, obscuring what we worked so hard to see. But we did manage to see the ship crash about 200 meters into the distance, onto the top of a large building. That was a stressful detour, so our son, Faber, sends us to reclaim a synth who thinks he's a raider, along with an Institute Corsa companion. When will you eggheads learn? Who spends his time on this whole quest, taking a relaxing swim in the irradiated ship water. Upon returning the synth to the Institute, we get a pretty sweet room given to us that we will once again never revisit. Father Son sends us to attack Bunker Hill, but we're loyal puppets to our railroad overlords, so we should probably warn them about the incoming attack. But we should probably visit Virgil first. I'm sure the Institute won't attack without me. And Virgil is no longer a giant, terrifying, deformed mutant. Instead a very handsome, regular-sized man. Hooray! Okay, now we'll warn the railroad of the attack. Old Desi tells us to kill the Corsa who joins us and help the railroad. So we did this, despite the lack of an actual quest marker or objective. Wandered into Bunker Hill, everyone was friendly to us besides the occasional turrets, and we kinda just said hey to the simps and that was it. Oh, and somehow the Brotherhood ended up winning the battle. So we meet up with daddy -o, I mean father, I mean our son, on top of the CIT ruins, and he's a little upset we failed our mission. There will be accusations that you deliberately sabotaged the mission. I'd like you to join me inside. But he invites us to the next director meeting, and despite failing the one mission we were tasked with, he names me the next director of the Institute. I am naming my father as my successor. Oh boy. But all these politics are exhausting. Let's help a suspicious ghoul in Good Neighbor named Bobby No Nose dig an underground hole into Diamond City to steal some shit. But before we can continue, we have to save our friend Mel who's locked in Diamond City Prison. But apparently we're too stupid to work out how without killing every single guard. So we leave, and then he just kind of gets released from the prison. What a waste of time. So him and his iBot help us blow through underground walls like paper. But they're no use against the armies of terrifying Mylurks we're forced to face. And we eventually tunnel up into... Hancock's personal storage area. She lied to us. So we immediately turn on her and gun her down. Lied to us, Bobby. You have to pay. You can't do this to me. This nice lady gives us a minigun, which also causes fire damage, so that's nice. We tell Hancock we put Bobby down, and now he wants to be our friend. One of the scientists from the Institute wants help retrieving something called a beryllium agitator, 
and we'll have to contend with the Brotherhood. Require a beryllium agitator for us. Oh man, I have one of those, but it's in my other pants. As soon as we enter the teleporter, the Brotherhood immediately hate us, and we'll never see our true love paladin dance again. But first go round, we get domed. So instead, we head to the Museum of Witchcraft, where we enter our own personal horror movie, complete with scary noises and jump-scaring mannequins. <laughs> Thank god we'd managed to uninstall the Alex Jones mod, or this quest would have been 10 times more horrific. But a savage Deathclaw rocks up, and hands us our ass. So we try to hide, but find a nice little egg which we steal and run away with. It's okay, we're not the worst people alive, we're not going to turn it into a Deathclaw omelette. Instead, we return the egg to a mummy Deathclaw who doesn't attack us. It's a miracle! Upon returning to the Institute, a few scientists are protesting our appointment as director by locking themselves in the bioscience lab. So we sneak around the back and open the gorilla cage and let them run havoc on all the traitors. We return to the quest for the berry activator, this time in power armor, but break our armor and in the process, our arms and shoulders. We eliminate the entire Brotherhood presence and retrieve the Brittle Augmenter and proceed to be enslaved and forever in servitude to our robot overlords. After years of service to our kings and gods, the robots, we pull a daring escape, destroying them all and returning to the Institute with the bazooka armadillo thing that they wanted. But of course our work is never done as the future director of the Institute, so we're sent to convince some random scientist dude from the wasteland to join up with the Institute. Poor guy. Knowing what comes later, we probably shouldn't have tried so hard to get him on board. Father has us record a propaganda speech for the Institute to broadcast to the wasteland as a whole. Damn it, man, I wanted my first sponsored post to be something I actually believed in. But before broadcasting the speech, we do a few quests for the railroad so that maybe one day we can complete our Patriot quest and save the Simps. So we climb a bridge, get reamed by a Deathclaw, return, get knocked off the building, and then succeed on our third attempt. Then we place a device for the railroad in a dangling monorail. We head out to find Agent Blackbird, but are ambushed by yet another Deathclaw, who runs away. Also, Blackbird is dead. Before our excellent work, we receive a weapon that we'll use through basically the rest of the game, DLC included, and that is the beautiful Gal's Rifle. We head to Diamond City Radio, walk straight past Travis the radio host, and just start fucking around with his radio by moving and adding new parts. This will let us broadcast our little propaganda speech to the Commonwealth. Returning to the Institute, we head to the grand opening of the new reactor and switch that bish on. This leads to yet another meeting with the top dogs of the Institute where we tell them to focus on improving Institute weapons instead of making more synths. Sean asks us to take care of the railroad and kill Desdemona because they're causing issues for the Institute. The railroad leadership needs to be eliminated. So of course I immediately go to warn Desdemona and proceed to do nothing. At the memory lounger, we listen to a goodbye holotape from H222, the synth we rescued near the church earlier, who is now having his memory wiped. But he and other simps need a path out, which was recently taken over by Gen 1 simps from the Institute, who we have to clear out of the Molden Center. We climb another building to place another Mila device. Another Deathclaw takes a go at us, and we run. Can't be dealing with those big death lizards anymore, it's bad for the heart. At University Point, we clear out both the Mylurks and the Synths to try and re-secure the safe house for the railroad. And holy shit, we're finally approached by a Synth within the Institute, letting us know that it's time to meet with Z114 to continue the operation against the Institute. After a brief chat with Z1, we learn the Brotherhood have learnt the railroad's location, so we head back immediately to warn Desdemona of the incoming threat. The Brotherhood's on their way here. What? Whilst there, a band of brothers break through the wall in the HQ, and we begin mowing down everyone from scribe to fully power-armored Brotherhood Knight. Glory, a member of the railroad and a synth, dies in front of us just outside the HQ, which fuels our rage to clear out the rest of the church of these pesky Brotherhood. We're popping heads left, right and center with our Gauss rifle and brand new railway rifle. The old railway spike through the eye never gets old. We decide to continue our rage-filled vengeance on the Brotherhood by heading to the Cambridge Police Station with Deacon and Tinker Tom, 
killing once again every single Brotherhood unit and stealing a fresh new Vertibird. Using this, we fly straight to the Pridwen airship to finish them off for good. On the flight over, we receive a spare Brotherhood outfit to try and blend in, but wearing full power armor makes it a little difficult to slip a little costume on, and by the time we land, the Brotherhood already know we aren't friendly. So we murder hundreds of Brotherhood soldiers across the entire airship, not sparing a single woman, man, or... Well, you can't kill children, so this dude survived. Until this happened. Shit! Elder Maxon put up the most fight, but we bested him in the end, and then, as I said, besties. But our rampage of tyranny and destruction doesn't end there. Straight into the Institute, who still like us? We murder all the synths and the scientists in the teleporter room, and bring our friends in. Running through the back rooms and corridors of the Institute, pumping railway spikes through anything or anyone that gets in our way. We meet up with Dad, Father, our son, Sean, whatever you want to call him. He's looking a little worse for wear. He's also a little disappointed in what we're doing. Ruin humanity's best hope for the future. The only question left then is why you're standing here. Did you just come to gloat? I'll have no hand in what you're doing. Now go. Leave me. And we all know that a parent being disappointed in you is the worst fear- Oh wait, he's our kid. Never mind. See ya, sucker. The reactor we just turned on. That's our ticket out of here. We place a sexy little explosive on the core and teleport back to the entrance. Where little child simp Sean, or not, maybe? Is it ever confirmed? Yes, we saw him get shut down. Asked to join us. Why not? We're in the business of helping synths. It's what we do. So we teleport out to the top of a building with a big red feck off button and a perfect yet distant enough view of the Institute. We smack it with all our might and goddamn what a sight. The death of my son and everyone who had the most potential to make the world a better and safer place. It's a good day to be alive. Approximately six years later, after we'd completed Automatron and Far Harbor, videos coming soon, we find a note from Patriot, or Liam. You remember him. In this note, this suicide note, he calls us the worst person in the world, curses us out, wishes us a slow and painful death, and says we deserve everything bad that has or will ever happen to us for what we did to the Institute. So yeah, we definitely made the right decision siding with the railroad. There's no way that could ever be debated. And that was the Fallout 4 experience. Make sure you stay tuned for all three major story DLC coming in no time at all. And you better subscribe to the Let's Play channel first link in description, or else.